Yeah, hi, um, I'm Jamie Hoyle, and I'm here to talk to you about my experiences dealing with, with the security of the Internet of Things as someone building the Internet of Things, rather than as a security researcher or student, you know, trying to tear holes in it. I'm not a ghostly apparition, as the talk title may suggest, so if you're expecting something supernatural, I'm really quite sorry. Um, so firstly, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a software engineer, uh, so I run a software consultancy called Carambyte. And as part of this, I've worked on order-on-demand systems and built entire platforms for IoT vendors. Uh, I also work on a logistics analytics startup that requires us to securely manage a lot of device, data from an awful lot of devices, so some of the things cross over. The only really relevant thing I've done security-wise is a Chrome extension called Chromebleed, which was a Chrome extension that checked if sites were vulnerable to the Heartbleed bug. It somehow got an awful lot of press coverage. So, for example, according to Business Insider, I'm a security researcher. Spoiler alert, I'm absolutely not. Uh, according to Gee.com, I'm a kind of modern superhero, and according to anyone who actually knows me, I am massively overrated. So uh, the last one's probably the most accurate there, but uh, let's go into what I'm going to cover today. So I'm going to cover a few basic things about uh, security and Internet of Things, and what we can learn with it, both as a manufacturer and both as people using it. Uh, just a quick note, the, obviously LT is a super broad spectrum of devices. Uh, my expertise lies in home control, so like light switches and plug sockets, so that's the frame of reference I'll use but I'll touch into a few other bits and pieces as well. Uh, we're going to look at some lessons learned from instance, both well-publicized ones and some like war stories from uh, my time in LT. Uh, so there's just a bit of personal experience in there as well. And the effect of vendors like um, Apple and Amazon trying to get into this market. Uh, and then they've got some time to, uh, for any of the questions, so please, please use that time. Um, so the security of the Internet of Things is pretty difficult to sum up, but if I had to condense it into just a single like emoji, it's, it's, it's appalling. Uh, I said that, and I work in IoT, so we're not, we're not going to make any bones about it. Security is a real issue for a lot of Internet of Things firms. Uh, but for, there's an interesting reason behind all of this, so let's examine the industry a little bit uh, in more close detail. So I like to split the industry into Tier 1 and Tier 2 vendors. So there's outliers on either side. It's not a perfect model, but I think it, like, it fits quite well. So tier one vendors, these people you've probably heard of, so like uh, Belkin, Netgear, that kind of uh, st uh, standard. The main thing about these vendors is that they own their own IP. Uh, they write the firmware, they control their cloud servers, their own apps. It's all done in-house, and we'll talk about that, why that's a really good thing later. Uh, tier one vendors also design their own hardware. So they'll work to their own designs, and they'll probably employ industrial designers. They'll probably still use off the shelf chips though, and, and sometimes share PCVs with other manufacturers. There's a weird expectation that people like Belkin own their own factories, and that isn't true. Uh, even Apple used Foxconn to make iPhones. Uh, with that said, they'll have control over production times and uh, production runs. Uh, tier 2 vendors in comparison are completely different. A lot of products are like no name for no name vendors aren't their designs, their code, anything. They'll have very little input into hardware design. As a rough, rough figure, plastic injection molds for a custom piece of firm, uh, custom piece of hardware cost twenty thousand dollars each. So it's far easier if people just go ahead and use the standard design. There's no code audits. Um, company I worked with didn't even have access to their own source code for their firmware or server. The firmware was just a binary file that was handed to them by the factory. And let's be honest, anything could have been running on there. The server was like a memory-eating Java behemoth that we ended up having to uh, decompile and recompile to make emergency changes to. And the worrying thing about this, that isn't a one-off, that's commonplace. Thankfully, the developers at that manufacturing firm were good enough to leave all the packages unobfuscated and the private keys with no password required. So, thanks, folks. Um, finally, of course, they don't own their own factories, but they also don't control them either. Production rooms are fairly often uh, booked weeks and months in advance, uh, which becomes an issue for responsible disclosure later on. So all those things seem pretty bad on their own, right? It only, it's only when you start to put them all together that the real issue with the industry becomes apparent. So let's say you found a critical security vulnerability in the firmware of like a tier two demonstration firm. When, the, when you're reporting a security bug, what's the first thing one of you would do? Just find like a, a technical contact, right? Someone at the company you can speak to and let them know that something's not quite right. Well, unfortunately, as we like uh, touched upon earlier, all software is done overseas, and there is no dedicated technical contact. The only choice is to speak to sales and tell them their software is broken. That works super well. Um, so let's say file, you, you get through sales, unlikely, and you try and find someone who can try and sort the problem. They'll need to go and speak to their manufacturer's engineering team, who 
I guarantee you from experience, will deny there's an issue with their, their system. It'll take two weeks, three weeks more for the problem to even be acknowledged. If you're lucky, they'll implement it in their next firmware revisions, well, on the next batch of devices. Um, has the company gotten over the error update function? It costs money, so probably not. And that pushes responsible disclosure of your hard fought bug right out the window. If you're unlucky, they won't bother fixing it, um, because none of their, um, yeah, because it's end of life, none of their customers care as long as they're making mad dollar. So the only solution there is just to drink copiously. Um, so why does this happen? Well, if we start with something uh, people already know, IoT is a gold rush. Uh, developers are expensive upfront cost, but licensing someone else's design is generally just per unit. So the capital required to start up an Internet of Things firm is far lower using other people's code than doing it the correct way. Even if you do it the right way, security isn't a priority. Security is treated a similar way to IT at traditional organizations. It doesn't make the company any money, so why should the vendor pay extra for it? It's not on a cost sheet, so it gets ignored. The final reason that security of uh, Internet of Things firms is so terrible is because no one assumes they're a target. I've had people tell me before that there's so many bigger other companies to choose from, so why would an attacker pick them? That's completely flawed logic, as all of us here will know. And when every manufacturer then also thinks, oh, there's someone else to choose, there's a serious problem behind the scenes. Now, we've heard that X year is Linux, the year of Linux on the desktop, but really, 2017 is the year of Linux, the Linux bus stop, because everything runs on the Linux embedded kernel. Everything. Which is great, because it makes my job easier. Unfortunately, it also makes my job easier, so cutting corners is far, far easier than it used to be. It's now trivially simple to start up your own Internet of Things startup and start selling products, and I would say probably dangerously so. There's no single accreditation or standard for the Internet of Things, so it's difficult to know who's doing it properly. But this is something I'll talk about a bit later in more detail. So I'm just going to jump into a case study now. Uh, for just uh, full disclosure, some details have been changed to protect the guilty. Um, I'll jump in, so yeah, it's, it's autumn, I'm walking through London, I'm on holiday, and I get a panicked call from one of my clients. Uh, there's been a dispute over the quality of products that they received, and the manufacturer is threatening to pull all of their cloud services until payment for the non-working devices is received. At the time, their cloud service was split between two main providers, one for their newer devices and one for their older devices. Our previous project with that firm was to migrate their new devices onto a bespoke platform because they'd realized that having so much of their operational dependency on a third party was a pretty bad idea. Uh, this migration was thankfully uh, completed a few days prior to that incident, but the old plugs, we haven't started looking at those yet. The holiday part of the business holiday abruptly ends, and we do as best we can. We take backups to the server state, we change passwords, we clean up bits and pieces. Of course, none of this particularly helps when the... Uh, Manufacturing firm has backdoored their own server. So it's dead. The backups are useless because every restore just um, reactivates the backdoor. 5,000 units are now offline, not even controllable from their own Wi-Fi network because everything goes through the cloud. What the hell do we do now? So step one is we look for data regress. We find that they didn't manage to link off the database. They're just holding the client to ransom over the actual server and the actual operational uh, capability rather than the data on it. Step two is look at the source code. Oh, wait, sorry, yeah, no, there isn't any source code. Uh, the manufacturers said that they didn't need to have it, and they were never going to get hacked. See earlier slide. So why would they have it? We get a shipment of about 20 of the older devices. Rounded up and around their office. They don't sell the devices anymore, and all they have left are faulty returns. So we don't know if it isn't working because we're doing it wrong, or because the devices don't actually work. Um, they don't, uh, so there's two models of devices that, the old, that use the older server that were knocked offline. Model A, which is about 75% of the install base, and Model B, which is about 25% of the install base. So it's time to fire up the reverse engineering ion cam. <laughs> Great. So armed with these slightly faulty test devices and some information, we crack one open and we notice that Model A has a similar chip to their newer devices, which we just released an improved backend for using their existing protocols. Uh, we looked in the iOS app source code for the new device and realized there's a conditional in there. And it stops devices, starting with a certain four characters of the MAC address, from using that app. Now, to me, that would indicate there was a marketing limitation rather than a technical limitation, and that the actual underlying protocols behind those two devices were pretty much the same. So the first thing we try to do is try to onboard these devices to our new server that we control using those protocols. 
And incredibly, yeah, it works. Uh, or correction, about 75%. The 75% that we're running on Model A works. Model B doesn't. So we get, but either way, we get our iOS developer to expedite and update to the iOS app, and that goes live the next day. And so the support requests are quite receiving, starts to stem a bit. Um, so model B then is our issue. Uh, we have no pros code documentations, no source code, nothing. We host a local DNS server, so it thinks, the plug thinks that it's pointing to the client's uh, server. And we start trying to onboard the Model B devices to a local machine with a Wireshark intercept intercepting uh, all UDP traffic. Thankfully, they didn't bother trying to obfuscate or encrypt any of the onboarding protocol, otherwise I probably wouldn't be here speaking to you now. Uh, the protocol looks similar, but not identical to that of uh, Model A and the newer devices. The only real difference was the checksum. The checksum was completely different to the first set of devices. So we figured that, okay, this manufacturer uses used a, a white label um, product to start off with. So I'm assuming here that their actual man their manufacturer overseas has been a bit lazy and reused that code somewhere. So we went to try and look around and find a few apps that look similar to our clients so we'd have an actual server to onboard with and an app to onboard with to compare the traffic. And yeah, we, we found that. If you notice all the assets are the same, the UI is slightly different, but the names, the uh, iconography, it's all the same. So we decompiled the Android APK, but yes, those are both Android apps, despite working very much like iOS apps. Uh, both uh, the Android APK to find which server it was onboarding to, and thankfully, it was still responding to requests, which is great. So we now have the server that the device is onboard with. As I said before, onboarding wasn't encrypted, so we could compare the old server's response to how our new in-house server was responding. The good news was that, as we expected, um, the only thing incorrect was the last four bytes, that is, the checksum. So the rest of the protocol we had worked out pretty much all right. At that point, we had like one real choice, which is to try and reverse engineer their um, checksum algorithm so we could implement it ourselves. And I, I wasn't privy to this, but somehow my colleague managed to do that in two hours, and he wouldn't let me talk about this unless that boy went in there, so I'm sorry. Uh, we perform a, a few checks to uh, make sure that the devices are onboarding correctly, and they do, so we ring our client to tell them the good news. Uh, our client sends out some marketing letters, letting customers know that we'd upgraded their experience by giving them access to new features that the old app didn't have. The customers love their new feature access, and there was a fairly low rate of return, which is remarkable for a story of essentially intrusion force modernization. And the good news for this company is that all of their new devices are now controlled by us end to end from cloud services to firmware. It was a lesson that was a tough one for them to learn, but their customers are now, we think, better off for it. So what can we learn from that incident? The first thing, and that again, this will seem obvious to all of us in the room, is to make sure that you own or at least have a copy of your source code. If you don't have that source code and something bad happens, like a supplier dispute, then you're pretty much screwed unless you have a big old slice of luck. In this instance, we had two, and they were both down to manufacturing laziness. Our first slice of luck was that they reused the chipset, and the second one that they reused the entire app and protocol, and more importantly, were obvious about it. Uh, the second is that attackers won't always come from where you think they will. The protocol that powered those plugs was actually pretty well designed. And the cloud control server was reasonably well designed to avoid standard things like injection attacks. However, the only thing the company accounted for was for external actors. And they didn't consider that someone inside the company or one of their suppliers would be a source of a problem. And the third thing is that you should have layers of redundancy always. I'm talking about in terms of cloud servers, so have backup servers, and also in control. So what I mean by control redundancy is the ability for your users to be able to control a device that you manufacture. Regardless of anything else, your users should be able to control a device from your local network. We could be in the middle of thermonuclear war, and which as Trump as president probably doesn't seem that unlikely an event to plan for, and the device should be controllable if it has power. Uh, my client counted the little switch on the side that you can use to turn it on and off as local control, and I, quite frankly, do not. Uh, the next level up from this is cloud control. Um, this is the bit that uh, most people buy devices for. This should work, but the real question is for what length of time? I would say five years is the minimum, and as much as reasonably possible after that. There's no good reason why you can't port old devices to use your new technology stack. But not enough has changed in the past decade to make existing devices obsolete. When you buy an IoT device, I believe you're buying the hardware. There's no guarantee that servers will be still running in five years' time, or even if the company will exist in five years' time. 
the final thing here is vendor integration. Now, this is the tip of my period. This is, this is the thing that I think matters the least in terms of control redundancy. If your, if this and that integration goes down, then your users can still use your application via local control or cloud control. But the problem is that unlike uh, different control methods, the vendor integration is the one that the, the, the marketing uses, the one that makes the most money for IoT firms. So I've seen issues where we've had to reduce the security or been asked to reduce the security of our cloud and local control uh, to make sure that if this and that works properly. Because that's the bit that they sell plugs on, that's the bit they sell devices on, and that's the bit that makes them the money, so that's the bit they focus on the most. It's my job to try and tell them that's in the case. Um, so yeah, um, what on earth is going on here? There we go. Uh, Google, however, disagrees with all of that. Uh, as you may be aware, they acquired a company called Revolve in 2014, and immediately they stopped selling devices. Two years later, they shut down their local cloud services and they rendered the app and hub useless. They didn't have the base parts of that pyramid, so that pyramid there, local control, that wasn't possible with uh, Revolve. So what happens when the IoT firm that you've relied on for all of your smart home gets shut down? How will you use the devices that you've spent hundreds of pounds integrating into your life? So, yeah, uh, sorry, one moment. Yeah, so the first thing when I'm buying a device is make sure that I have the means to control it locally, be it manually or via a platform like HomeKit, but again, we'll touch on that later. And I think, yeah, I've already touched on vendor integration on this slide. So the final thing to learn here is that security develop software developers are not security experts. We may claim to be. We may even be told we are by the press. We may even come to a security conference and give a presentation on security, but we don't know what we're doing. Unless your code has been audited and pen tested by an actual security researcher like one of you, um, I wouldn't trust it. I've seen it go very badly wrong very quickly. Even for huge projects like OpenSSL, all it takes is someone not validating a payload length parameter properly for the internet to go mental. Okay, so that's something that happened to me and what we learned from it. Next, in true Monty Python style, it's time for something completely different. Let's look at Mirai, which off uh, naming conventions alone deserves to be on this list, um, and what we can learn from that too. I'm guessing a fair few in the room have heard, have heard of Mirai, right? Uh, for those of you who haven't, it's an IoT botnet that took over devices, we'll go into the nitty gritty of quite how later, to perform a record breaking DDoS attack, uh, like it pumped 660 gigabits a second at Crepton Security, and 1.1 terabits a second at OVH, the French hosting provider. Whilst it was known that these attacks were happening, because service providers had to deal with them after all, it wasn't publicly detected until the source code leaked on our hack forums. Um, so yeah, it hijacked them at using fetched devices, not publicly detected. And it mainly infected things like CCTV and IP cameras, but also things like DVRs and routers. As an aside, during the research for this segment of the talk, uh, I came across someone who'd uploaded the whole source code to GitHub with this warning. The zip file for the repo is identified as, as, uh, by some AV programs as malware. Please take caution. I mean, that would be because it is literally malware. like. Um, but I'm, I'll briefly go over how Mirai works because, I'm, again, I'm guessing a lot of you in the room know this. Um, but then also examine the response to Mirai and the reasons why I think pans out, things panned out the way they did based off being in the industry at the time. So the first thing Mirai did was continuously scan the whole of the internet for vulnerable devices. Once it identified a vulnerable device, it attempted to uh, brute force um, SSH access onto the device by cycling through 61 different sets of credentials. The important thing about these is that they were all factually loaded onto the devices. As we know, most consumers straight up don't change passwords unless they're actually told to. Uh, once the attack had shell access, it was trivial for it to execute a shell script, uh, download the payload, and listen to any requests from command and control servers. Uh, before the source code was released on hack forums, the original Mirai botnet had 330,000 devices under its control. Since then, there's been variants that use the same base source code, so the base, same base CNC method, but with the attack vector modified to target actual software vulnerabilities. Uh, one example of this was uh, Deutsche Telekom, who had 900,000 routers attacked because they were running a protocol called TR064, uh, which allows remote access functionality. And that server that behind the remote access functionality accepted commands without any authentication and was open to internet on a port, which was super smart. Um, so yeah, the final uh, thing about this is that it was such a low cost attack. The actual 330,000 device botnet ran on two P VPSs and two bare metal servers and made an awful lot of money. Uh, so who did they target? 
You're probably thinking that attacks of this size are probably at government institutions, at major sites, that kind of ilk. And you'd have to be 100% wrong. This is who they targeted, Minecraft servers. For a nice piece of continuity in this talk, the game server in question is actually one of my clients. So I'm both defending IoT issues and simultaneously causing IoT issues at the same time. Uh, the list of devices targeted can be found from the default credentials that they use. So this is a list of them here. How many people have ubiquitous kit at home and forgot to change the default SSH credentials? I'll freely admit, congratulations, firstly you're part of the problem, and I'll freely admit, I'm part of the problem. Because that's a, first, that's a very dangerous ambition to make at a security conference. And secondly, uh, yes, I did accidentally help DDoS my own client. Uh, no comment, and I'm receiving my offer of questions. Um, so yeah, from the password lists on the previous page, as I've said, it's easy to figure out which devices were most badly affected. Uh, one specific brand of camera, XM, was badly affected, with thousands of other cameras from like Samsung and VivoTech. Uh, say, as I said earlier, uh, ubiquitous networking uh, gear with default credentials was attacked. As by default, they can be managed remotely. A uh, variant of the initial Mirai attacks targeted a separate vulnerability with remote access, as I mentioned, the TR064 vulnerability. Uh, and that attacked things like TalkTalk, Talk, uh, KCOM, Deutsche Telekom, and Post Office, because the Post Office offer broadband now. Uh, all, and they all had their kit compromised. This goes back to the manufacturing process that I described earlier. They all had similar enough firmware and chipsets to be all hit with the same vulnerability. What's personally worrying for me about this isn't the DDoS. That's, that was bad, but recoverable. But what a truly malicious person could have done with this level of access. If you can write script files to the file system, odds are that you can retrieve data off the file system too. In an ideal world, you won't be able to, but I've, hope I've sufficiently demonstrated how terrible IoT firmware is at this point. Uh, the attack has to cameras, for example, some of which will store a history of video recordings. Attackers had a window into people's homes. Rather than the DDoS attack that people can recover from, that could have ruined people's reputations permanently if it was targeted. So devices compromised by this attack were targeted located all over the world. This is just a single snapshot um, from Encapsula uh, showing the scale of the Mirai breach. The interconnected uh, nature of our supply chain and internet means that in the modern era, breaches like this spread fast. The worldwide scale of the Mirai botnet is an attacker's dream. Traditional heuristics who were used to mitigate DDoS attacks are far less effective when it's coming from residential IPs from every single country on Earth. Apart from Greenland, for some reason. Um, but yeah, so there was only really three main ways that IoT firms could have tried to mitigate the threat from Mirai. And I wish them probably from best to worst here. Uh, the best way that IoT firms could try to mitigate the attack was to release a software update to force users to change their passwords. However, for a second, let's just flip back to the why this happens slide for a second. Uh, there's no strong business case for releasing that update. Most customers won't even be aware that their devices are being used as a botnet. And all that releasing a software update does is say to your customers, oh, hey, yeah, we did something wrong. Uh, you need to change your passwords now. It tells them something's going on. Second thing is you're introducing user friction. So when the user is next in the market to buy a new router or a CCTV camera, they'll just remember the time they had to change their passwords because in their eyes, you got hacked. It's only key players like Deutsche Telekom who release software updates for that kit. And that was in a non-user obvious way because it was fixing a vulnerability rather than a credentials issue. So the second way that uh, manufacturers could deal with Mirai is to do recalls. From a business perspective, this is a worst case scenario. It costs money, money for packaging, it costs money to create a fix, it costs money to ship it back. The main reason you'd ever need to issue a recall uh, would be because you haven't built in any over the air functionality because as we said earlier, OTA costs money. However, I would argue it would have cost XM far less money to build in an OTA functionality two years ago than it would have been to recall 10,000 cameras, update their firmware, and ship them all back out again. The final thing companies can do, and this is the cop-out response, is just to tell users to change their passwords. Alternatively, they can completely absolve themselves from any responsibility to mitigate this risk because page 243 of the instruction manual tells users to change passwords. As we said earlier, users don't change passwords. Uh, and as well as this, uh, Mirai uncovered a whole host of systematic failings about how we as an industry write and maintain software. First of all, default credentials. It's far easier and less effort for us as manufacturers, manufacturers and vendors if every device shares a default username and password. I'd argue this is a mute point though. If BT of all people can stick some stickers on their home hubs with randomized usernames and passwords, your manufacturing process can do it too. The second systematic failing here is a lack of user update functionality in an awful lot of devices be it over the internet or manual upload from a local network. This means that bugs simply don't get retroactively fixed. If you're lucky, your reported vulnerability may get fixed in the next batch if you can give the manufacturer give a damn. 
if you have over the air functionality in your software, then it means you can fix issues for existing devices and nip some problems in the book. This is made even easier, e e e uh, sorry. This is made even easier if you actually have access to your own developers and your own source code, which, as we said earlier, isn't that common. The final thing is, it showed how slow some companies respond to news and Mirai. It's disappointing as a consumer to see firms care so little about their own products, but as I said earlier, IoT is a gold rush. This is expected behavior. All of this brings me on to a more personal point. With traditional systems like a desktop machine or a laptop, it's very easy to see what's running on the device. Everyone in this room knows their way around an operating system, and it's fairly obvious when something isn't right. You'll notice background processes or an unusually high network load. This changes for Internet of Things devices. More often than not, they're black box systems, so you have no way of knowing what code is running on there. The vast majority aren't open source, and even if they were, getting software, or getting the firmware off the device to compare against an open source build is pretty difficult. So how do we know that our devices aren't being used as part of a botnet? We don't. It could be downloaded via an exploit and you don't know, or it could even be pre-installed at the factory. Antivirus royalty does not exist, despite what Sophos may claim, and they may try and sell you a free liquid reason. Uh, even worse than this is there's precious little hardware integrity verification as well. When you buy an Intel chip, you know that it's probably not going to do anything malicious. How do you know what's running inside your device without cracking it open and voiding the warranty? Uh, so, does anyone know what uh, chipset Philips Hue runs on, for example? No, exactly. Does anyone even know the manufacturer? No. Point is that users don't know what hardware and software their lights and home security are being controlled by, and there's no set standard for, or even a real way to verify devices legitimate. That's fairly terrifying. So this leads on to another obvious question. So we, at the moment, we can't verify the Internet of Things, but how do we start to? There's no single standardization body. Sure, there's things like the Wi-Fi Alliance to make sure that devices conform to Wi-Fi standards for a hefty fee, but nothing for IoT as a whole. Quite simply, there's no guarantee that the device you buy today will work tomorrow. Um, Apple, Amazon, if this and that, have tried pushing their own standards, and Google's trying to get on that game as well. We'll go over what Apple and Amazon's programs actually certify in a second, but for the, con uh, the concept of any one of those gaining market superiority, it's kind of troubling because competition quality will decrease as a result if one single platform wins. You would think that, as manufacturers, we would have code signing to at least verify that updates come from us. But I've seen too many over there updates not implement signature checking to believe that this is commonplace. Again, it goes back to what I said at the very beginning. Security isn't on the cost sheet, so there's no attention placed to it. So yeah, nowadays, IoT is everywhere. All the major players are involved in the industry, Google are, Amazon are, and so are the uh, Fruity Co, but at this point, I've signed so much paperwork for them, I don't know if I can say their name anymore. Uh, this has a really interesting effect on in the uh, industry, because there's a lot of competing standards that every Internet of Things vendor is rushing for compliance with. And it's interesting to look at what the security implications of that are. So as soon as I mentioned standards, this probably was the first thing that popped into a lot of your heads. So this XKCD is fairly representative of what's going on right now, but I've chosen just to focus on HomeKit and Amazon Alexa, because that gives us two contrasting uh, opinions. So HomeKit is probably the most interesting vendor sanitization push. Sadly, it's one I can't go into juicy detail over, because they have a sniper just up there. Uh, but I'm just going to go over things that are in the public domain, and I promise these are in the public domain if there are any Apple Wallets in the room. Uh, they have a HomeKit approval uh, program that is, well and away, the most thorough and expensive affiliation you can get right now. It's due to the sheer amount of testing they do and compliance documents that you've got to fill in before you even get a chance of getting a product into a store. It also kind of acts as a filter, so because only people who are in the industry for the long game are going to pay Apple a five, six figure sum to try and go down the HomeKit path. Uh, HomeKit is an interesting one, because it actually interfaces directly with devices rather than via a cloud server. It supports BLE as well as IP, so Ethernet and Wi-Fi, as control mechanisms. And the interesting thing about HomeKit is that the design decisions behind it are some of the best I've seen working in the industry. It forces security by design, which is kind of rare in IoT. So how does HomeKit use BLE or IP for control? Uh, it uses your Apple ID to generate public and private key pairs that then become your HomeKit identity. So these keys are stored in keychain for sync between devices, and only synced in keychains are actually encrypted. Uh, all control requests, so turn your lights on, are carried out locally and via communications protocol of Apple's own design. Uh, it's up to us as manufacturers to implement that. So, for example, if our cloud servers go down forevermore, your devices will still be controllable via HomeKit as long as the concept of an Apple ID exists in some remote form. 
um, it switches the burden of uptime from the manufacturer to Apple, uh, which is something that many companies find attractive to the point where HomeKit-only devices are starting to be released. As an aside, this is why you need uh, an iPad or an Apple TV in your house to control devices via HomeKit remotely, because they act as the bridge on the network, and thanks to Keychain, they have a copy of your public and private key, so they can successfully authenticate the device. Um, what well, one of those keys, anyway. Sorry. Uh, another thing that Apple mandates is out-of-the-box pairing codes that must be randomized and must be branded a certain way. Say so Apple's section on branding and the generation setup codes is longer than some technical device specifications that I've seen for entire devices. The pairing code is what binds your device to your Apple's ID, so it stops on-network attacks from taking over your device. A piece of spyware on your Mac, for example, can't constantly scan your network for new devices and then try setting it up using a factory default code. Um, all of that really means that a Mirai-esque attack isn't capable over HomeKit alone, at least as far as I can tell. Devices are not accessible remotely, apart from a bridge, and you'd have to break the ED225519 um, certificate standard to control them without an Apple account. And you can't mine in the middle of the setup process, because each setup code has to be random. Of course, every specification in the world doesn't mean anything if it's not checked. Apple's actually reduced their requirements in recent times, but they still run a full suite of tests on production-ready units before they give you the green light to even produce the things. Again, this forces kind of security by design, which is a huge thing in our industry. A nice add-on for this is that you kind of have to hire people who know what they're doing with HomeKit and what know what they're doing with security, so that will generally mean that other things are done correctly as well, but not always. Uh, the other key player is works for Alexa. So this has far looser restrictions than HomeKit, and the cost of entry is far lower. It only costs about a £1,000 per device to submit for certification, and that certification will last you for the, length, the lifespan of that device. The important thing here is that devices still go for uh, laboratory testing. This testing, however, isn't to do with security. It's just simply making sure that you call the right things to actually work with Alexa. They'll ensure basic things like um, you know, that you're carrying traffic over HTTPS, for example, and yes, I have seen that not happen, uh, but it's mainly Amazon-centric. The interesting thing they do that caught us out is that two-way feedback's required. That is, they expect you that your app should have a socket connection or a similar kind of operation to ensure that application status is instantly updated. So this is a functionality that our current client, a firm called Wifebook, had, but a feature that we decided to upgrade around the time of uh, their NAC testing, so SOS law dictates, that it stopped working during the two minutes that they were testing for, and that was a fun weekend. Um, so I'm going to round off this talk by saying what I look for in IoT devices and how you can tell companies at least trying to approach IoT from the right angle. Doing the IoT the right way is actually really difficult, contrary to popular belief. Um, so yeah, we, as I say, we're currently working with a firm called Wi-Fi Plug, and we have been doing them since August. And I'd like to state here, the company in case study one is not Wi-Fi Plug. I need to keep my equity um, at least somewhat solid. No. Uh, well, how are they, hopefully nowadays they're a decent example of this. Uh, so I'm going to work through some things that we've identified working with them and how we try to mitigate them. So given the focus on IoT vulnerabilities right now, there are so many different attack vectors that we need to be aware of as manufacturers. The main problem is that we need to worry about every single part of the stack. Rather than the traditional software startup, uh, which may have a single application attack surface, the attack surface for an IoT device goes from the actual hardware and firmware to the cloud offering as well. It's rare that one small IoT firm will have the expertise in hardware, firmware, and cloud services necessary to fully secure a system. So what we've done, we've brought in consultants for parts that we aren't really sure of. Um, another thing to consider is how do we handle personally identifying information? A lot of IoT firms don't consider their data as PII, because at the end of the day, it's just logs of someone switching on, switching on a plug, for example. Um, but the issue is that what the kind of data we have is, gold mine, is a gold mine for even a petty thief. We know when people are turning their devices on and off, we know when they have timers set for, and even what their current energy usage is. If someone got access to our data, they could work out if someone was at home or not. Um, this is a huge responsibility for us, and we need to treat it with great caution and store data securely and properly. This also involves deciding how long we need to store data for. The Alexa voice case uh, currently going on in the US is a prime example of this. So uh, for those of you not aware, Amazon have been subpoenaed for voice recordings made in the vicinity of an Alexa from a couple of years ago. They've kept them for training data, and now the US government wants to use them in a murder case. So whilst training data is useful, there comes a point where customer security and privacy needs to come ahead of training your own natural language capabilities. So what do I look for when I'm buying a smart device? The first thing I check for is if it has some kind of external accreditation. Uh, for small firms, I look for either Wi-Fi Alliance accreditation and, or if it's a licensed HomeKit product. 
Not because that means they're secure, but that means that the amount of money they've spent on those two programs means they're probably in it for the long haul rather than trying to make a quick book. Uh, if it lacks one of those two things, that isn't necessarily bad. Just do a bit more research for buying your product. The next thing on my list is if a device has over-the-air update functionality. It's difficult to tell if manufacturers use signed firmware without gathering the battery for yourself, but having OTA present and documented means that security vulnerabilities can, not necessarily will, but can be fixed without retooling and being pushed out, and can, can be pushed out to existing devices. The third thing, for small companies at least, is a listed technical point of contact. Having someone listed who's contactable about security issues and technical issues means there's a strong possibility they actually write their own code. This means that bug fixes are more likely to happen, and in combination with all their updates, this can only be a good thing. The final thing on my list is some kind of evidence of local control capability. This is optional because it's rare that this feature will be documented anyway. Have a scoot around online and see if anyone's tried to get into the bugger. My rule of thumb for small firms is just to assume the cloud servers will go offline at any moment because, again, I've seen it happen. It's not great. So it's super easy for me to say what you should look for. So how, diff but how difficult is that list to implement for manufacturers? So as we've just finished building a smart plug, I'm quite well placed to answer this. So we've been working on a, a plug called the Wife Plug Home, which is HomeKit compatible. It's a smart plug. It's quite proud that it's going to be the only HomeKit smart plug in the market that takes a single plug socket uh, as just on the side. So what we found during this process, it was a blend of trying to balance what marketing wants and what the security concerns sold inside of me wants. There's some things that would have been awesome to do, including from a marketing perspective, so one such setup, but that isn't simply possible to do without fairy man in the middle. Uh, the project started in December 2015, but we were only brought on board in like um, August. So this meant that we couldn't choose things like chipsets or PCBs, and there's a limited selection of HomeKit compatible chipsets anyway, so that isn't really that much of an issue. Uh, at least what that means now is that we own every section of the stack, so we have the capability to push out software updates the same day as a vulnerability being disclosed if we can fix it in time. Uh, the next thing is to think about the security implications of every single decision. At one point, we we're going to implement a trigger style sim system similar to if this and that. The problem is that there'd be a huge issue data protection wise. Um, thankfully, if this and that, I've just released an Applets SDK that we're integrating instead, so they can handle that for us. The final thing is on my checklist was to design for offline first, right? So as I said before, a nuclear Armageddon could take out your data center and your plug should still work if you want it to. So we're using um, MQTT for client-side communication and it means our plug doesn't actually care if it's paired to our server or your server. So if you change the configuration URL, then it's good to go. So I say, remember that we're familiar? It's how coincidental we do it. Uh, so just a quick aside, we do all of this and if you go to that site and use that code, you'll get some money off if you want to try an IoT device. I mean, manage product replacement, right? Go do it. Uh, so yeah, that concludes my talk on the security of Internet of Things. So if you want to ask me any questions about any of this, including the process of building a smart plug, then just let me know. Hi. Hi, sorry, the, the Mirai botnet stuff, I've been following it reasonably closely, and one of the things I never understood is how the devices ended up exposed on the internet. Aren't most of them behind at least a router firewall or something, or are they using UPnP to pl punch out? Sure, so yeah, that's um, an interesting thing. I think the main thing that I focused on were, when I was researching this was, say, the Meraki stuff, because that is actually network level, that's the bit that is exposed to the internet. Um, with CCTV cameras, I believe, I say, I think it was the UPnP punching, but I'm not certain, so... So, actually, people should be scanning their own home networks. Yeah. <laughs> I, my advice, yeah, say, just scan your own networks, make sure that you haven't got open ports, make sure that you're actually aware of what kind of data is available. Like, yeah. have, have the control you think you have. Yeah, exactly, rather than just assume that manufacturers are doing it properly because they haven't. Cheers. Yep. Yeah. So you mentioned about um, uh, sort of compliance with these various new standards that are coming out, yeah. um, and that there's a cost associated with that. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts around the problem of consumers always wanting the cheapest device? So going to the the dodgy Chinese manufacturer yeah. who makes the knockoff still compatible but not actually compliant. Yeah, sure. So this is a really big issue for us actually. Um, 
because we're in a space, in our space, we're one of the most expensive plugs on the market because we do things like Wi-Fi Alliance, we work in Wacko or HomeKit. You can buy a smart plug for 15 quid. Um, and for all intents and purposes, it'll probably do the same thing. The issue then, I think, becomes one of consumer education. So it's similar to what Apple's done with iPhones. So Apple can charge 7 quid for an iPhone because they've said, hey, uh, it's better, it's more secure, body bar, body bar, body bar. People don't have the same kind of thought process for plugs and switches, but it's something I think we as industry need to do. We need to educate people about the risk more. Anyone else? Just following on from the uh, the question over there about uh, the device sitting behind the network uh, and obviously yeah. having net, uh, network address translation to translate between public and private. What's the implication then we move to IPv6 where every single device potentially has a publicly accessible IP address? Sure. Um, so I think one of the reasons that Mariah was so successful because was the limited space of IPv4, right? You can scan every single IPv4 address in a week. With IPv6, um, kind of security uh, obscurity comes into play, which isn't a good suggestion, but there is so m many more IPv6 addresses to scan that it's not possible to carry out a similar kind of attack right now, I would suggest. Is that everybody else? Um, so, IoT is beginning to be used as a buzzword, just like cyber yeah. and everything else under the sun. Um, so I was more interested in how you defined IoT being in the industry. Sure. So for me, um, IoT really it covers, I would actually argue on the buzzword side, because I would argue anything that was traditionally not connected to the internet that now is. So for example, even like nuclear power plants, um, I would argue that falls under IoT. Uh, I think as an industry, we need to do better about how we classify consumer enterprise IoT. Because calling, say, calling a nuclear power plant an IoT device isn't accurate, but it is technically correct. So uh, that probably doesn't answer your question. <laughs> um, yeah. So you say IoT is more of a process than it is a thing? Yes. I'd, I'd say that I, I, IoT is a process of making something that wasn't internet connected, internet connected. So traditional plugs, traditional switches. All good? Oh. Well, thanks so much.